of life. I'm coming alive. Good morning, LCC. If you believe that Jesus is alive, make some noise or drop an amen into the comment section. We are so happy that you're joining us today, whether that is online or in person. If this is your first time, we just want to take a second and say welcome to a place where you belong. There's all kinds of awesome ways for you to find an area to belong throughout the week by checking out our Facebook page. We do um, Zoom meetings for moms, for teenagers, for facing fear. So there's all kinds of awesome opportunities to find somewhere where you can feel like you belong. If at any point during this service you have a prayer request, um, Katie is going to drop a link for that in the comment section. Feel free to just fill that out. We have awesome prayer teams that are waiting to pray for you. Um, we believe that life change happens through prayer. So we're going to take the next couple minutes and worship God. Uh, the Bible tells us that when we pray and we come before God that his spirit will fall on us. For all, and it's not just for one person. It's for all people. So today... During worship, I just want to encourage you to receive God's spirit. Um, so we're going to begin to pray that. Dear God, thank you so much that you give us your spirit. We pray right now that your spirit falls on us, Lord God. Give us an encounter with you, Lord God. We've come to get closer to you to see your spirit, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Take us deeper today, Lord God.
worship you.
Take a moment and speak out where you are, if you're in your living room or your car or wherever. Just speak out some of the goodness of God. Speak out what he's done for you. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, what do you have that you didn't get? What do you have that God didn't give you? So speak out some goodness. You're still alive. You're drawing breath. I know it's tough in these coronavirus times, and I know it's tough not being around the people we want to be around. And that gets old after nearly six months of it, but there's still some goodness to praise God for, and I don't care what bad news you have, focus on some good, and let's just take a moment, thank Him for the good, let's thank Him for each other, look across your Facebook feed, and thank Him for those who are watching with you, and look into this room, and thank Him for the people who, who He's chosen to place in a family with you here in this church, and thank Him for the things that you do have. Lord, we come before you asking you to give us an attitude of gratitude. Lord, give us, a, we'll sing of your goodness, Lord. We'll, we'll praise you for your goodness, Lord. Maybe we have needs and maybe we have things that we want to come before you and, 
and, and seek your will and seek uh, your healing in, Lord. But right now we pause to thank you for what we do have, Lord, not, not to ask you for what we don't. Right now we give you praise, Lord. We offer our time, talent, and treasure before you in praise, Lord. We offer back to you what you've given to us, Lord. We thank you for families, and we thank you for our church. We thank you for your word, Lord, and your blessings. We thank you, Lord, that we are still alive right now, Lord, and that we, uh, we're not homeless right now, Lord. We thank you for we thank you for the many blessings you pour out on us, Lord. We, we look toward you, Lord. We look toward you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, if you've reached your end with this coronavirus quarantine or you're struggling in something right now or you've had a bad news from a doctor this week or if you need prayer, our prayer teams would love to pray for you. There's a form that we'll put online here. You can have them pray for you. You can do it anonymously or if you want them to contact you and pray for you over the phone or through the internet, they'll be happy to do that as well. We're trying our best as a church to figure out how you do the things of faith in the middle of a, a, a this, this strange season, this year of 2020. And normally we would call you forward and the prayer teams would pray for you at an altar, but uh, that's not possible now. So uh, we'll call you forward to fill out that form. And uh, if you're anonymous, it'll be anonymous. It'll be shared with the prayer teams, but nobody will know who it is. And uh, if you're not on our prayer teams, if you use it for your gossip anyhow. So... Um, uh, they want to pray for you, and I believe Jesus wants to heal us in this season. And I believe he wants to feel like he's doing something in this season. So uh, we look to him for that, and we look to him now for healing. And uh, if, But I, I do think focusing on an attitude of gratitude and what we have in our hand is probably far more important than what we don't have. Life is largely about the things that we don't have, if, you, if you'll let it be. And living a real life is about focusing on what you do have we've been looking at second corinthians chapters eight and nine i intended that to be one sermon but it's grown into three now because i think it's such an important piece and that's what paul's talking about here in second corinthians chapter nine where we come to today we'll start in verse six but uh, paul's been saying there are really two kinds of people they are givers and takers there are people who always need always take always look to the world for their purposes and for what they want. Sometimes those people are dirt poor and they can't get out of that and look to what they could have or what they do have. Sometimes those people are multiple billionaires that just can't get out of their own center, their own self, and realize that we exist on this earth to give, not to take. And so Paul, because he's having these problems in Corinth, and the problem at Corinth was you had these these false apostles who had crept in and these false apostles were basically singing the song that was already in the head of the Corinthians and that was themselves me 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 and they were teaching them how to be you how to be get what you want out of life how to and, and so they were teaching what they wanted and obviously we all like people who teach what we want to hear problem is you can never grow if somebody's only mirroring what's down inside of you You'll never change your viewpoint. You'll never grow if you, all you're hearing is your own voice amplified through others. And so basically in Corinth, we had takers following takers. The false apostles had crept in and were taking people away in Corinth and leading them astray and using them for their own purposes, whether that was their own popularity, their own ego, their own sense of being. They were using them for their own purpose. And takers often are taken in by takers. So it's really hard for the taking world. And, and when we talk about a taking world, we talk about consumerism, we talk about the ethos of this world. And I think the church at Corinth was very much like America today, where we have trouble understanding someone who gives. We have trouble understanding somebody who exists for others, not for themselves. But we, we understand people who take. We, we, as a matter of fact, have reached a place, a society, where I think we glorify lying and taking and hoarding and amassing money and amassing fame. We, we glorify entirely the wrong things. And, and it's really because it's hard to understand somebody who sacrificially gives or gives, as this text is repeated, one of the words we've looked at in this two chapters, 
is the word haplotes, which is usually translated generously in the English standard, but it means more than that. It means simple giving. It means to give, I mean, we think of generous giving as writing a big check, but, but it really means simple giving. In other words, giving without some strange motive, giving for the right reason, giving for the right motive. A lot of people give, it's what the motive is about. We understand somebody who gives so they can get their name in lights. We understand somebody who gives so that they can feel like the, their soul is better somehow. Paul's talking about giving simply because it's a God thing to do. And, and remember, in these two chapters, Paul here is talking about money. He's talking about money because they made a pledge for money a year earlier. But we could apply this to time, talent, or treasure, and we have been applying it to time, talent, or treasure. So it's not just talking about money, it's talking about how we use the time, talent, and treasure that's in our hands, which is all that we really have. In chapter 8, verse 9, he gives us the best example and probably the whole centerpiece of his argument. Chapter 8, verse 9, he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he, he owned the whole universe, he owned everything, yet for your sake he became poor. He chose to walk around in our flesh and live on our earth and die on a cross and live in the poverty of humanity, which would have been huge poverty compared to heaven. Had he been a billionaire on earth, he would have still come a long way from heaven to earth, but he chose to come to earth as a common, essentially homeless, uh, the poor working class, walked around nearly homeless, didn't have money in his pocket. Uh, he chose to be even poor among the poor. So, so he says, for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. Jesus didn't come to take anything. If he had come for us to worship him while he was here, he would have demanded we bow down and worship him. If he had came for political power, he would have overthrown the Roman Empire and taken all the political power. He already had it all. He set it all up. If he had came for money, he, could, he already owned the whole earth. He could have had it all. He chose instead to come to give for you and to give everything he had for you, which is something that the world has trouble understanding. And when you're a Christ follower, and I think where Paul is pointing out here, because he struggled for nine chapters with these people at Corinth, and they're taking ways or their ways of following the wrong crowd or following the wrong person. And I, and I think it really drills down here to Paul saying, if you've ever encountered the heart of Jesus, you can no longer be a taker. You have to be a giver. You no longer, if you've ever encountered the heart of Jesus and he's transformed your heart, he's transformed it from what's in this for me to what is in this for me to do for you. You know, there are two kinds of people. There are the kind of people that walk in the room and they say, hey, here I am, glad, glad you all saw me today. And there's the kind of person that walks in the room and says, hey, there you all are. There you are, I'm here for you. Jesus was certainly the kind of person who stepped into our earth and said, there you are. I'm here for you, and he was a giver. So if you know him, he's going to change you, and it's going to be very deep change. Tim Keller wrote in one of his books about surface versus deep idols. Sometimes we have surface idols, and we think Christianity is about these surface idols. Uh, you know, money is a surface idol. Money is, money is neither good or bad, but it becomes a surface idol. It becomes the sort of thing we can see, and we believe that's what our idolatry is about. But nobody really loves money for money's sake. I mean, if you take a dollar bill out, it's just a piece of paper with one printed on it. That's all it is. It's the thing that money does for us that we love money for. Money maybe buys the comfort or security that we think that we can get on our own terms apart from God. Therefore, money becomes an idol because the security of money takes the place of our security in God. And so the deep idol is really security. Or maybe money gives me a position over it and it makes me feel more important than you because I'm richer than you. And that's a big one in our society. But really the deep idol there is not money. The deep idol is the, the popularity that I want, the need for people to see me and feel that I'm important. So, so anytime we look at an idol, we push through to these deeper idols, these things that are driving the thing behind our idol. 99% of the time we focus on a surface idol without getting down to the deep idols. Paul here is drilling down into the depth of idolatry, the depth of the error of the Corinthian church, because he's talking about more than just giving. He's talking about more than just time, talent, and treasure. He's talking about the very heart that motivates everything underneath of it. 
And if we can get the deep idol underneath of our surface idols, it will change us profoundly. And the only way you're going to get there is by encountering Jesus, by encountering the one who gave up everything to come and give for you. And the only way you're really going to approach getting rid of these deep idols is to learn what Paul's taught us in the last couple of chapters, that we have to stop being takers. And the only way I know to stop being a taker is to start being a giver. When you start using your time, talent, and treasure to glorify God and build up other people rather than glorifying yourself, then you start shifting. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Some of the deep idols I think we deal with, are the deepest idol of all and the one we all struggle with the most is self. The deepest idol is somehow believing you're God, somehow believing you're better than other people, somehow believing that the world really does center around you. It's easy to fall in that trap because, well, I've been stuck behind these eyes now for 51 years. So the world really does center around me for my purposes. But if you just pay a little attention, you'd notice that everybody else has the same set of eyes. Everybody else is stuck in the body that they live in. And the truth is the world really doesn't center around me. Self is the biggest idol we have. And, and ultimately, all of our problems come from competing with God. Am I going to be God? self, me, or is God going to be God? Because if God is God, then self exists for him. But if I'm the only the highest thing I can think of, if I'm God, then everybody else exists for me. And you become a profound taker. Another deep idol I think we deal with is security. We want to reach some place where we're secure. We believe if we just had another dollar an hour in a raise, we'd be secure. If we just had a few more dollars, a bigger house, a bigger whatever, if we just... We, we keep chasing this thing, and, and now that I'm 51 years old, I think I've finally realized no matter how secure you think you are, it could be taken away. And for a lot of us during coronavirus, that's the lesson maybe we've learned, is everything that you think is on autopilot in your life and secure and that's nailed down may not be so nailed down, but one of the deep idols is trying to find that place where you sit back and relax and comfort takes over and you're secure. And, and I don't think on this side of heaven Christians could ever feel secure. I think Jesus, understand Jesus is attacking your deep idols. We're going to look at that next week. Next week then in chapter 10, Paul runs headlong into that. Jesus, uh, so some people say, well, I feel like God is against me. Yeah, he probably is against some of the things in your heart. He's working to change your heart. God has a, a, a deep interest in changing the deep idols of our life. And that's what he's working on. Paul here in Corinth doesn't just talk about the superficial stuff that's the problem in Corinth. He's drilling down to the deepest of idolatry that's happening in the church. Sometimes one of those idols, that deep idol, is, is status. I have to have to have status over top of somebody else. You, you know, this is what drives racism, really. The, the idea that somehow I was born with a certain skin color or background or accent or whatever that somehow makes me better than you just by nature of where I was born or how I was born. I mean, and that can never be taken away because I was born that way. It, it, it's that whole status and security thing mixed together. But it only takes a minute to realize that Jesus, who was a very likely dark-skinned Jewish man from the Middle East, um, it doesn't take long when you come to Jesus to realize that he came for all people not just people of a certain color. As a matter of fact, racism becomes, racism is a surface idol, believe it or not, because the deeper idol is really the status that I believe I have because I was born that way. It's part of our fallen nature. And, and, and another idol I think we fight, a deep idol, is the idea of safety. And Paul here talking about money, I think safety is what keeps us stuck in our money. It keeps us stuck not giving because we feel like, well, if I give that money, I might need it or if I give that thing, I might need it. We feel like there's some sense of safety somewhere, but maybe this pandemic season, maybe it's made us aware that safe isn't as safe as we thought it would be. So the real issue here is Paul's opponents are building idols of self. Paul's opponents in 2 Corinthians are building the idolatry of self. They're catering to the idolatry of self. I've heard this text we come to today preached so many times about me, me, me. It's been so mispreached, especially if you're flipping through television preachers. They love this text. It's about giving, sowing. You hear, sow a seed offering so that you'll reap great things, more money, tenfold increase today. 
And, and really all they're doing is taking something that's meant to strip us of our idols and reinforcing our idolatry. They've t they're taking something that's meant to free us of our idols and making them even more idol-oriented. And that's what the opponents of Paul were doing. They were creating idols of themselves. Truth is, when we give our time, talent, and treasure, it's going to change our heart. It comes because we have a changed heart, and when we do it, it changes our heart more. It, it's a little like exercise. You, you know, you, you start exercising, and you start feeling better, and you start exercising more. And when you can exercise more, you start feeling more and better. And, and giving is the same way. We give because Jesus first gave. We give because we've encountered him. But the more we give our time, talent, and treasure, the more we become free of the idols that keep us in the world system, and the more we're able to move forward. So, so remember, Paul says our giving, and he uses it about five times, I think, in these two chapters, the word haplotes, or simplicity, or generously. Our giving is something that's done sim, and that's what he means by simple. It's simple in that I'm giving to glorify God because, well, he's the one who gave it all, and I'm giving to benefit others because giving to benefit self isn't giving at all, is it? If I'm giving to benefit, and some people, how do you give to benefit yourself? Well, if you're giving to get your name up in lights, you're benefiting yourself. If you're giving to make yourself feel better, you're giving to benefit yourself. So, so simple giving simply means to give for the right motive. Uh, remember another word we've looked at over the last two chapters is the word overflow. It's used, I think, three times in these two chapters that there is an overflow, that God presents us with an extra. I don't care how poor you are. I don't care how time-stretched you are. I don't care how talentless you think you are. There is some area in your life where you have a little margin, overflow, extra. Maybe an extra dollar in your pocket. It may be an extra hour in the day. It may be an extra bit of talent. And you're wondering, why do I do that? Why am I able to sing in the shower and it's beautiful and nobody ever hears it? Why am I, able, why am I a writer? Why am I able to fix things? Why am I able... It, and, and you're wondering why that overflow seems there. Well, that overflow comes from God, and that overflow is always meant to overflow into other people's lives. When I give, I start realizing God is bigger than me. And, and you, you know... If you've ever had an encounter with God, if you've ever been filled with the Spirit, I, I think you're well aware that God is bigger than you. And, and maybe that's something we're not so aware of, because the church in Corinth seemed to be missing the point. I think they had misunderstood and thought maybe they were the point and God wasn't. That maybe the church was the point, or maybe who was important in the church was the point, or maybe who was the great super apostles that Paul is coming against here, maybe they were the point, but maybe they had forgotten that God was the point, because God is bigger than me, he's bigger than my problems, he's bigger than this world we live in, he's bigger than me, and in one encounter with him, that's what we should know. And so once we encounter God, Paul's thesis here is there has to be something tangible, action. It's one thing to sit back and say, yes, I'm a Christ follower. Yes, I believe in Jesus. Yes, I'm a Christian. But if you are a Christian, something tangible happens. And I think that tangible thing is that we give our time, talent, and treasure. That we realize that my time isn't about me anymore. That my talent wasn't for me. That my ability to sing in the shower wasn't to make the shower sound nice. Maybe it was meant to bless other people. And my money is not mine either. My money belongs to God. And how I use every dime of that money, it, it, it's up to Him what I do with it. So there's always a tangible. And if it's going to be tangible, it has to be an action. And that's why people don't like to talk about money. That's why people don't like to talk about giving. Because it's something that's very real. It's easy to fool yourself into thinking you're following Christ. But... You know, really, I can see the direction of your life. It, it, I, I used to say this years ago, but now it sounds really old. I would say, give me your checkbook and your day timer, and I can tell you where your life's headed. I can tell you the priority of your life. But most of you who are under 30 are thinking, what's a checkbook and what's a day timer? So, so I guess uh, let me look at your online bill payer, and let me look at your, your Google Calendar, and then we can tell you exactly how your life is prioritized. How are you using your time and how are you using your money? That'll show you exactly where tangibly your life is headed, where, what your priority is. We, we can think our priority is a lot of things, and Corinth thought their priority was in a lot of areas. But Paul here drills down to, look, you all have been playing around with taking this offering for a year. 
Maybe we need to examine your priorities. Maybe the tangible proof of who you claim you are. These false leaders have not led you into, into God's presence. They've led you away because you haven't even fulfilled this obligation. It's tangible, and that's part of the reason we don't like to talk about it. Giving versus taking, it's really about destroying the idol of self. It's about just digging down into that idol of self, those uh, security. You know, security, the, the, the idolatry of security leaves us with fear. We're afraid. It's why we're afraid to do anything. Well, why wouldn't I sing that song in front of the church? Well, I'm afraid people won't like it or they'll laugh at me or, they'll, or I'll hit a sour note. Uh, we, we value security, the deep idol, more than we value using our talent for God's purposes. But we're afraid that whatever I put out there, why, why wouldn't I give that message of prophecy in the church? Well, what if somebody thinks bad of me? What if I get it wrong? What if blah, blah, blah? And, and all that fear of what everybody's going to think or what everybody's going to imagine or, or, or that I'm going to lose something, all that fear works opposite. So our deep idol is really that sense of security and fear. All of our status that becomes a, a deep idol, well, we have to decide who we want to applaud for us. And that's part of what Paul's coming out in Corinth here. Do, do you want these false apostles and the crowd of Corinth applauding for you? Or do you want Jesus applauding for you? Because generally you can't have both. You generally cannot have the world proud of you and clapping and thinking you're a great person and have Jesus thinking you're a great person. Moving in the prophetic means often you're moving against the flow of the world. The world doesn't understand you. They don't get you. So the simple truth is our status, has, we have to choose, will my status come from God or will my status come from the world? Uh, who I am, my identity, who I see, how I see myself, is that based on how the world sees or how the world measures things? And if you watch a lot of television, you can't help but measure things the world, way the world measures. When it comes to money, have you noticed even the poor people on TV live better than most of us? It's supposed to be a poor house, and I'm thinking, that ain't no poor house. These, the, the, these people got a lot more room and a lot more stuff than I do. I mean, everybody has a car, and everybody, the, the, you don't see actual struggle. And it's because, well, it's because television's paid for by advertisers, and advertisers want you to spend money, so they don't want you to think about poverty. They want you to think you need more stuff. And more and more, they just put... So you have to decide, well, I measure my world by my neighbors, by the cultural standards we have, by my family, my cousins, my... Well, I, how will I measure my success, or will I measure my success in Christ? And, and, and the two usually don't go along together. Usually your success will be in Christ, or your success... You, you know, look at Jesus, who left everything to come here and die on a cross. If, if he had cared what the world thought, he never would have done that. He didn't care what the world thought. He cared about what God thought. He cared about God's purpose. Uh, if our safety, I mean, looking for safety in the world, one of these deep idols, we, we can choose to trust in ourselves or trust in, in God. Your safety only comes when you trust in God, but if you're going to trust in God, it means you've got to release self. And it means you've got to release the illusion that somehow you're in charge of your life. and you're, Maybe that's something coronavirus is teaching us too. Maybe it's teaching that we have to release the illusion that we're in control of this world, that, we're, that I can somehow produce my own safety. I think we had lulled ourselves into believing that science could fix all problems. I think we'd lulled ourselves into believing that somehow or another our government or science or the, whoever it was could fix every problem, and we take our, took our safety in government and science, and maybe God is trying to point out to us that he wants to break that idol, and maybe the only real safety comes in him. One day you will be in a box up here in front of this church, and I'll be saying some words over you, and, and when that happens, you know something? All the safety you thought you had in this world means nothing. There is only one person that can rescue you from that box, and that's the one who came out of his own box. That's the one who came out of his own tomb. He can rescue you from that. There is only one real safety, and that's in the very risky way of following Jesus. So, so let's look at verse 6. Verse 6, the point is this. Here's the whole point. Paul finally drills down to the whole point. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Uh, first point I want to make in verse 6 is, sowing involves giving to meet the needs of others and glorifying God. You remember, we've went through this in the last two weeks. We've looked at using spiritual gifts. We can glorify God 
We can build up believers, and then we have the gift itself, and then we have the giver of the gift. And, and the order should be I focus on glorifying God and building believers by using the gift that I'm giving. But if I'm focusing on me, look what I'm doing, and look, look at the gift that I'm giving, then glorifying God and building believers becomes a side note. It's not part of it. It's not the focus of it anymore. So when Paul talks about sowing, he's talking about when I use my time, talent, or treasure to glorify God and build up other people. It's haplotes, the simple motive, the simple, generous motive of helping somebody else and glorifying God. God getting the glory, which means that maybe I have to give anonymously. Maybe it's not about everybody. Clap. You know how you can tell whether God's getting the glory and you're giving or not? Come to church and volunteer for a couple hours, and then you're all grumpy for the next three days because I didn't call you because the pastor didn't call you, and thank you for your wonderful time that you spent working around the church. Um, well, what were you doing it for? Were you doing it for my applause? Were you doing it for the church? Church didn't recognize my time spent cleaning her up around the building here. Uh, well, well, you know what? Were you doing it for, the, for us to recognize, or were you doing it so Jesus would recognize it? You can tell your motive by what you get upset over. You can tell your motive. I teach this to my discipleship class. You can tell your motive why you're doing something by the reasons you're thinking about quitting. If you're thinking about stopping doing something, well, I'm not going to give to that church. They don't, they don't acknowledge how great I am in giving. Well, your point in giving wasn't haplotes or simple generosity. Your, your point in giving was to get acknowledgement or get credit or get applause or get somebody to pay attention to you, and that's a deep idol. That's the sort of deep idol that we're working, about, working in here. So, so remember, we use our time, talent, and treasure to glorify God, build up believers, and then we worry about the gift and the giver. And we do it in that order. And the motive always has to be haplote, simplicity. The motive in all of our giving has to be glorifying God and building up people. So when Paul talks about sowing, that's what he means. But he uses the metaphor here of a garden. And, and the truth is, I benefit most from my giving, but not always in the ways that I would think. It's not like the TV preachers teach you, you know, sow a seed offering today and you'll get a tenfold increase. I guarantee you, you sow an offering in your time, talent, or treasure, you'll get an increase. I don't know if it'll be tenfold, and I'm not even sure it'll be the same thing coming back because I don't always want the same. When I plant my garden, I don't always want the same thing I planted coming back. When I plant a tomato seed, I'd like to have a tomato, not another tomato seed. When, 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 I, when I plant something... I don't necessarily want the same thing I planted coming back. I'm hoping for something bigger, better, different. I'm hoping for something that works better. Which brings us to the whole garden illustration, which is what Paul is using, sowing and reaping. He's talking about planting a garden, something that I love, and my, probably my main hobby is planting gardens and working in gardens. It's something about it, this, the, the idea that I put seed in the ground and then it comes up. It, 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 but here's something I've learned in gardening. If you don't ever put any seed out, you don't ever get any fruit. You know, you've got a little bag of seed, and you're thinking, well, I could just eat these 10 bean seeds. Yeah, you could eat the 10 bean seed, or you could plant them. And if you plant them, you get an increase. But the problem with planting them is you have to release them. And when I plant something, I have to put it in the ground. I have to release it, and it may or may not come up the way I thought it may some bird may steal it something may happen it's really out of my control and whatever makes that seed begin growing it's still a mystery to me my turnip greens and my kale and stuff started sprouting in this rain and that now it's about this high and it's just a mystery to me how a little seed the size of a speck of dust is now this high and eventually eventually my collard greens will be about this high and they started as a little speck of dust and that's just a mystery to me and giving becomes that sort of mystery. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about lining ourselves up with God so we can see the mystery of God. It's, it's, when we're giving, when we're gardening, when we're sowing and reaping, we're participating in creation. We're, we're part of a miracle. And, and if you're the kind of Christian who says, well, I've never seen a miracle in my life, you're not using your time, talent, and treasure for Jesus then. Because... I've seen multiplications of time, talent, and treasure. I've seen, I have given immense amounts of time. I was thinking this week, I've been playing around with floors in my house while we're in this quarantine, and I was thinking about when we renovated this building. 
I was putting three or four days a week in this building and still managing everything else that I did. And I'm wondering, where did that time come from? And, and there's just something about it when you're volunteering, and I did that as a volunteer, when you're volunteering for Jesus, when you're giving, it seems like he always makes sure you have enough of time, talent, or treasure. He multiplies, he gives you more of it, and it's a whole lot like gardening. If you put the seed out, you're going to get more. You're going to have more. You're going to increase more and more. So, so that seed and the increase both come from God. Seed is a mystery to me, too, how that works how, and, and how it increases. And to participate with God in that miracle of giving, now, now just to make it clear here, when I, if I give $100 in an offering today, uh, that doesn't mean that I'm going to get $120 back next week. If it is, then that would be an investment everybody would make. The things I get back, you know, I sow a tomato seed and I get a tomato. Tomatoes are the best thing on earth to me, okay? I love my tomatoes. But um, tomato seeds, they're not the best thing in the whole world. The tomato seeds aren't really anything to eat at all. They're, they're kind of the problem with tomatoes. So, so the truth is the seed and what the fruit that I get are often very different things. And sometimes what I get is better than that. I, I, I've told this story a few times here, but Linda and I, when we first came to the church, first came in the being serious about our faith, uh, we decided that we would tithe faithfully and give faithfully with money. And for six months, we tithed faithfully. I mean, we didn't really have the money. We didn't know it didn't really fit. I mean, we, we had some debt, quite a bit of it that needed paid off. Uh, we, we picked up some in the first few years of our marriage, and we, we were trying to tithe and give faithfully. And, and I remember coming up on December of that year, and we got our real estate tax bills and got our personal property tax bills, and we got all these bills started stacking up, and, and I, I sat down, I took care of the bills back then, and about the first week of December, I looked and realized that I was a certain amount, I could almost say the money now without bragging because it's been so long ago, it seems like a pittance, but we, we were like $4,000 short or $5,000 short, and, and being able to pay the bills that December, and it was pretty pretty tough looking. And, and, I, and I was getting ready for my taxes because I was that sort of person who was wired to think ahead, and so I was adding up what we'd given for the year, and it turned out that what we had given was exactly what we were short. I mean, almost to the penny, the, the amount we were short in paying the bills in December was exactly what we had given. And, and I'd like to say that God and his great wisdom just reached down from heaven and said, it'll be all right, son, here's the money. But he didn't. He let me stew in that for about two weeks because that's how God works. Because you know what he was really working at was that idol of self-sufficiency down in me. I was struggling. I mentioned a few weeks ago about struggling in faith and faith being a gift and how God gave me that gift of faith in December of the same year. And I think the two correlate together. Because what God was working on wasn't money. What he was working on was faith and the ability to trust and see him. And so when I finally said, okay, God, whatever, whatever, I've obeyed you, whatever you want to do, I'm not in control of my life. I'm not in control of my finances. You're going to have to take care of it. That was the exact moment when I had that vision of the older woman praying over her grandkids and saw Jesus and had that faith and began to see that Jesus was everywhere. It was when I went over the line in faith. What did I sow? Well, I sowed about $4,000 that year in tithing in that six months. That's what I sowed. What did I reap? I got faith that's still carrying me on 20 years later. I got a gift of faith that I, the $4,000 was cheap. Truth is, he gave me the faith, faith first. Then along about the beginning of January, after we managed, we did get enough money at Christmas, we managed to keep from losing anything. But at the first week of January, my boss walked in. I worked for the government at the time. We, they told me when they hired me there'd never be overtime. My boss walked in and said he was mad at City Hall and that we could work all the overtime we wanted. And so I did. I worked about 20, 25 hours a week until they stopped it, which about three months later they stopped it. But in the meantime, I paid off every ounce of debt that I had, and we stood coming into spring absolutely debt-free all the way ahead because what did God teach me? It wasn't about the money. It was about faith. I reaped something that I had sown, and it was something very different. I'd sown a tomato seed, the money, which it's just money. What I had reaped was actually faith. So, so Paul here, when he's talking about reaping and sowing, you will reap whatever, whatever sows bountifully, 
will reap bountifully. The more you put out there for God to work in, time, talent, and treasure, the more he's going to work in it and reveal himself into it. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart and not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, if, if I'm going to give, I need to give willingly. I mean, that's just a no-brainer to me, okay? Because why is that? Because the heart is the point. Jesus is trying to change our heart. He's trying to change. He doesn't need what you have. Has it ever dawned on you that Jesus does not need one thing that you have? Who do you think would preach this sermon better this morning, me or Jesus? Why he allows me to make it an offering, I have no clue. Why he includes me, the only reason I think he includes me is because he loves me. And he wants me to do something with him. Could Jesus clean this building better than you all? I'm thinking he could clean it like that. If he can create the universe by imagining it, I think he could do whatever he wanted. Could he build a building? Could he put a roof on this building better than we can? Yes, he can. But he wants us to do it alongside of him because he's more interested in your heart than the roof of this building or how clean it is. All this stuff is temporary. Your heart is a permanent thing. If you're a Christian, that's what's going to heaven. That's going to be in heaven. He's cha- that's why it's important we're cheerful givers. Our heart has to change because the heart is the point. God does not need anything you have. And if you're ever trying to give based on, well, I want to, God needs me. You know, God doesn't need you. He never needs you. God wants you. He wants you to use what you have. And and the attitude of cheerfulness, uh, cheerful giving comes from realizing God wants to participate in my life. He wants to be a part of my time, talent, and treasure. And he wants me to participate in his life. That's what giving is about. How much do we give? Well, it's willingness. You know, the truth is it's not a gift if it's not willing, is it? If God demanded that you gave time, talent, or treasure, if it was a demand, you know, people argue, should we tithe or not? I think 10% is a good benchmark, I do. But the simple truth is, if you're not willing, um, it's not really a gift anyhow, is it? I mean, if it's just because you somehow want to feel like you're obligated, God wants to lift your heart past that because a gift isn't something that you're obligated for. I mean, if I build you for my birthday present, and demanded that you give me a birthday present, would it be a birthday present? No, it's not a gift at all then. And remember the operative word we're working in here is charis or gift. Grace must be expressed graciously. Grace must be done with grace. And remember the word grace is a gift. So a gift must be given giftingly. A gift must be given where there is a sense of giving, of a gift. Guilt never comes from God. God never uses guilt to motivate you. He motivates you with love and promise in the future. If you're experiencing guilt when it comes to how you're using your time, talent, or treasure, then you haven't drilled down to the deep idols yet. You're letting the devil motivate things because the simple truth is God shows you possibilities, increase. He shows the possibilities, not the guilt. If, you don't, if I don't give, will I go to hell? I have no clue. I'm not the one who sends people to heaven or hell. I have no idea. But I do know that I get to give my time, talent, or treasure. You know, I, I thank God every day that my life is so oriented now that I can give almost all of my time, talent, and treasure to Jesus. And, and, and then that started 30 years ago when I gave some and started giving more and more and more. If you know Jesus, it'll, he'll break the idols in your life, and givers can't be takers. He will stop the taking. And, and so, I ha- so the idol that I'm not giving cheerfully, that I'm giving out obligation, that's something he wants to break in our life. Look to verse 8. And God is able to make all grace gift. Remember, that's the word gift. He's, made, he's able to give you all gifts is what it's saying. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, Paul repeats a word there. What, what's the word he repeated? All. God has all sufficiency in all things at all times. How about in the middle of coronavirus? Is that included in all times? How about in the middle of political weirdness in our world right now? Huh? Is he still, has he still got it in those times? Or does he only have it in the good times? He, he has all sufficiency in all things at all times that you may abound in every good work. You may abound in what? Now, this doesn't say you may abound so that you can go buy yourself a mansion or a new car. This says that you will abound in every good work. In other words, as I'm doing good works, glorifying God and building up people, 
I will use God's resources to do it more and more and more. It will increase. It will continue to increase. Why? Because God is able, which means I have to trust God more than myself. I have to trust his sources more than myself. God is the ultimate giver. He is the ultimate giver. Uh, Paul asks in, in, in chapter um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, Paul says, what do you have that you didn't receive? What do you have that you didn't receive? It's a profound question. What do you have that you didn't receive? Well, not even the next breath you're drawing. Not even the body that you inhabit. Not even the soul that you get. All of it you receive. It all comes from God. God gave you everything. When I said let's thank Him for what He's given us before we started this sermon, truth is everything, that the fact that you exist at all is a gift from God. And the purpose of all of this, the purpose, understand this, the purpose of your existence is that you abound in every good work. It's why you inhabit this body of yours so that you can glorify God and build up other people. It's why you exist. The purpose of it all is to abound in every good work. So all of us are receivers. All of us have received from God. And the reason we've received was forgiving. And when we know God's grace or charis, when we know the gift of God, and that's charis literally means a gift, when we know the gift of God, we're able to give God's gifts to other people. We understand that the gift is in my hand so that I could pass it on to somebody else. Maybe it's using your talent, the gift of singing or the gift of teaching or the gift of cleaning or the gift of, of, of fixing things. Those gifts are in your hands so that you can use those gifts to build up God's people. If it's the gift of money, then that money is in your hands so you can use it to build up God's people. If, if, it's, if, if it's time, if you have time to spend on God's things, that time is not there for you to binge watch Netflix. That time is there so that you can do something that builds up God's people. The idol we're dealing with here really is the idol of self-sufficiency, the idea that, that I can somehow be sufficient unto myself, that somehow it's the greatest of all human lies that somehow I exist for my own self. You know, there are really two ways to approach the world. Either I'm here for other people or everybody else is here for me. And today in our culture, it seems like more and more people glorify believing that everybody else is my pawn, that they exist for me instead of me existing for them. You can't do both at the same time. Either you're here to benefit others or others are here to benefit you. And if you're living a life where you believe others are here to benefit you, that's the reason you're depressed and anxious and tore up inside because the truth is everybody else is living their life to benefit themselves. I've learned that very few people are against you in this world. Most of them just are out there for themselves and they think that's what your purpose is too. You want to break that idol then you start giving yourself for others. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did? You know, you know why we hoard stuff, time, talent, or treasure? You know, why we, you know why we hoard these things, try to pack them away, try to make our time last, try to make our, try to make our treasure go forever, try to hoard it into a bank? We, we hoard things because we're afraid. You find somebody who has more money than they have since, more money than they need. You find somebody who's just got that money. So to, you, know, you know, in our culture, we glorify multimillionaires, billionaires so much. Billionaires are just very scared people. They're afraid. They're afraid to live life without that false security of that money. They're afraid of, they don't know God in that area of their life. And the simple truth is, those who hoard money and don't realize it was given to you to pass on to somebody else, uh, you're living in fear. You're living in the fear that somehow you can control your life and that massive amount of money you deposited in a bank account somehow or another is going to provide everything you need for eternity. Yeah, it'll buy you a nice tombstone, but you're not ever going to see it. Truth is, that fear is what's going to lead you further away from God. Paul here quotes Psalm 112. So you should read Psalm 112. I won't read it right now, but it'd be a good meditation for you this week. Psalm 112 is about a crazy wild scatterer. It's about someone who casts, just gives everything, just gives it all away. Just His time, talent, and treasure is all about giving, and it's all about, and, and it quotes Psalm 112. Uh, it's about the third verse from the last verse in the chapter that's quoting here. I don't remember the number. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor, and his righteousness endures forever. 
and the distributed freely means that he had, he's, he's sown wildly. I mean, this guy's taken all the seed and put it all on the field. This guy's going to be eating turnip greens this year because he has sown pounds of turnip. He has sown all over the place. He has crazily scattered and held nothing back, but his righteousness is what endures forever. You know how you get to be that sort of person? Understand that what you're sowing belongs to God and that God owns everything. If you can understand, you know what, we live in a world where everything is limited supply. We act like there's a little bitty pie and that if you get a piece, I don't get a piece. We act like a bunch of starved brats eating a little bitty pie. And the truth is, there isn't a little bitty pie. Jesus, what does it say? He is able to abound in all things at all times, all sufficiency in all things at all times. God has no limit of supply. He spoke and created all you see. He can spoke and create whatever he wants to. There is no limit with God. So if you want to be a wild scatterer in your time, talents, and treasure, understand God can create the miraculous all the time. He can generate more all the time. There isn't a shortage. There is never a shortage. And what I invest in eternity with by giving now will last forever. What I hoard now will not last forever time, talent, or treasure. What I use for God's purposes now will exist in eternity and be multiplied in eternity, but what I try to keep for my own self now, I'll eventually lose. Jesus actually said the one who was building the extra storehouses because he wanted to hoard, he said, you are a fool because you will die tonight. Your soul will be required tonight, and it will not matter what you store up once your soul has been required. So that brings us to the next thing I want to look at. Um, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing. Your seed for what? For sowing. For sowing more. doesn't say he'll give you more so you can hoard it. He's against the hoarding. That's a deep idol. He, he is sowing and, and, and he increased the harvest of your righteousness. What are you going to harvest? Righteousness. Doing the right thing. Here's your purpose. And he's drawing this out of Isaiah 55.10. If you read that, you'll see similarities there. He's pointing to our, serve, our purpose in life. Our purpose, your whole purpose in life, is to glorify God and build up other people. How do we do that? By sowing our time, talent, and treasure. The only way I can glorify God is using my time, talent, or treasure in order to glorify God. The only way that I can benefit other people is to use my time, talent, or treasure for benefiting other people. That's sowing. My purpose is to build, up, to, to build up people and to glorify God. And the only way I can do that is to choose to use my time, talent, or treasure to do it. There is no other way to glorify God. And it's an illusion if you think you've found another way to glorify God than using your time, talent, and treasure to glorify God. You have to take the time to pray, don't you? You have to have the talent, use your talent to do something that builds the kingdom and glorifies God. It's all we have, and the whole purpose is glorifying God and building up people. But the other purpose of this is something called righteousness. What is righteousness? That means a changed heart. The whole point of what Paul is talking to in Corinth, he says if you'd get this, guys, your heart would change and you would understand that false leaders are false leaders. If your heart was in the right place, you would get it. If your heart was where it was, in the right area, then it would all make sense to you, and this whole letter of 2 Corinthians would fall into place. It's called righteousness, a changed heart. So if you have something in your life, you have it for a purpose, time, talent, or treasure. It's there for a reason. And that purpose is real simple, glorify God and build up believers. It's the only purpose that matters, and it's the only thing that matters. Paul gets real simple here, doesn't he? I have it for a purpose. I exist for a purpose, glorifying God and building up people. I can only glorify God and build up people by using my time, talent, or treasure the way God told me to. That's the only way I can. Next thing, let's look at real quick. Um, you will be enriched in every way so that you can have riches. No. So you can be generous in every way, or haplotes, the word generous, so I can give without all the strings attached. Simple giving. Simple, pure giving. Why? Because I want to glorify God and build up people. Doesn't that simplify our giving if there are only really two motives in it? And, and that will produce thanksgiving before God. My heart starts changing. 
I become a heart of gratitude, a heart of changing. It produces thanksgiving. You know the best life on the face of the earth? It's the simple life. Worrying less about things, being afraid of things less. The simple life is the gift, the haplotes life, the life of simplicity, of generosity. That's where Jesus wants to lead you. He wants to lead you to a place where your heart is pure. Another heart purifying thing, he says, he begins talking about what the church of Jerusalem will find in this. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace or gift of God among us. You know what giving really does in the end? It places your heart in a community. If you're giving your time, talent, and treasure to binge-watching Netflix, your heart's going to be in Netflix. If you're giving your treasure to be in the country club crowd and be important, you know, that's where your heart's going to be. But if you're giving your time, talent, and treasure to glorify God and build up believers, then your heart's going to be in the community of God, and that's what he's pointing out here. Jerusalem's going to long for them. They're going to long for Jerusalem. Well, Jesus said it this way. He said, where your treasure is, there your heart is. You know, I've discovered this. I think I mentioned it last week. People who don't start giving somewhat of what you would imagine as a tithe to the church within the first month or so of coming, I don't care how bad their life was and what Jesus is doing in their life or how many miracles they've seen. If they don't start trusting God and the money right off, they don't get what I got six months in, and they end up drifting off and doing their own thing. And they're wondering, why is God not showing up in my life? It's because you failed to use your time, talent, and treasure to invest in changing your heart. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. You know what the greatest gift is and the thing I miss the most in this pandemic? The church. I miss you all who are electronic right now. We've got 20, 30 people that show up live, and then we've got a couple hundred electronic. And I miss being the church. I miss sitting on the patio and talking after service. I miss Thursday nights. I miss being the church. And, and one thing that coronavirus has taught me is that you all are a gift to me, and, and we're a gift to each other. And I do miss the church. Uh, that's what Paul's talking about here, each other. It's the greatest gift of all. It's the thing that's the most important. Using my time, talent, and treasure to build up the community. You know what I get? I get a community of God. I get a community. You ever thought that Liberty Community Church will be in heaven? You ever thought that the friendships and fellowship and brotherhood and sisterhood we have here in this church last forever? So if I'm going to confess Christ, if I'm going to confess his community... The only way I think I can confess Christ is using my time, talent, and treasure. I can't find any other way to confess Christ. Maybe you can. And if you can, um, email me and let me know some other way. But I think using your time, talent, and treasure is really the... You're fooling yourself if you're not using your time, talent, and treasure to confess Christ. You're, you're, you're serving those deep idols. and uh, uh, the, Serving Jesus, using my time, talent, and treasure to glorify God and build up believers, I, I think that's the only real confession of Christ that there is. How, as, as James says, can I confess him in my heart and not have the actions that go along with it? And the answer is no. I can't. Faith without works is dead, he says. It's not that works. It's not that giving gets us to heaven. But if you do have an encounter with Jesus, you can't help but give brings us to the very last thing thanks be to god for his inexpressible gift you know what i get i get the biggest gift of all the most inexpressible gift you know what the most inexpressible gift is jesus god almighty came to this earth for me died on a cross resurrected on the third day beaten bruised spit upon what a gift what a gift i wouldn't have done it for you wouldn't have done it for anybody, but he did it for me. It's something that's inexpressible to me. And if you could get your mind around that, you'd get your mind around how he wants to shift your heart. You know, the church itself is also an inexpressible gift. I've lived for the church for the last 20 years, and you know, the thing I love the most is the church. I love you all, and I love what the church is. And the church is one astounding gift if it's full of givers, and it's full... Of it's, it's his presence in us. It's where he manifests. I think we need a revival. We need the spirit of God among us. We need the power of God among us. 
We need the church to rise up and be the church in this next season. And you know, what are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus' very presence rising up in us. So as we close this, would you accept the greatest gift? And maybe that's what Paul's trying to say here. Maybe he's trying to say you can't keep following the idols of the world and following Jesus at the same time. You can't follow the false leaders of this world and follow Jesus at the same time. And if you just accept the gift, the greatest gift, the gift of Jesus, then you'd understand really quickly that he'd transform your heart and you start realizing that you're here to be a gift to others. And that's the whole point of life. Where do we come to in this? Well, I think the church at Corinth came to a hard point right here too, judging by chapter 10. The hard point is we need to get real with Jesus. And the only way I can get real with Jesus is in my time, talent, and treasure. There isn't anything else that can be real. The rest of it's some abstract something. The rest of it's something I can fool myself in. Would you accept the inexpressible gift today? The gift of Jesus? I know what you're thinking. Pastor, I accepted Jesus 20 years ago. Yeah, but would you accept him again today? Would you accept him into your life and heart today? You, you know, I... I'm not saying I need saved every day. I think salvation is sufficient, but I do think I have to bring a new part of my heart, deep idol before God every day. And I do think Jesus has to rescue me and save me from that every day. So in a sense, I'm working out my salvation with fear and trembling. Would you work out yours with us today? Would you just accept the inexpressible gift of Jesus? Don't try to reason it out. Don't try to think it out. Just accept the gift. And when you do that, I think you'll discover that your time, talent, and treasure doesn't exist for you. It exists for building, glorifying God and building up believers. As we worship in this next song, would you pray for a minute about what's in your hand, what you need to release, what you need to, how you need to express using time, talent, and treasure, and would you also have, accept this inexpressible gift? Dear Lord, help us to see this inexpressible gift right now. Help us to see you on the cross and understand just how much you gave up. You who was the richest of all became the poorest of all so that I could become the richest, Lord. You've given up your riches to become poor so that I could give up my poverty and become rich. It was all giving and was all for me, Lord. And I thank you, Lord. Now help me to have the same attitude. Help me to have the same attitude that I exist for others, that I exist, my time, talent, and treasure is not my own. It exists to glorify you and to build up other people, Lord. Purify us in this, Lord. And I pray as we close this part of, of 2 Corinthians, Lord, that you take Liberty Community Church and you stop us from being takers and turn us into great givers in this community and world, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing and what you're about to do, Lord. In your name, Jesus, I pray this. And I'm going to pray a quick blessing over you. We'll go out with this song, worship out with this song, and, and, and we'll just end with this song. So may God bless you. And may bless you with a changed heart that sees giving as, uh, as better than receiving. And may he give you a heart that understands his inexpressible gifts so that you can start being a part of that inexpressible gift. Pray that he blesses you this week, heals you, and sets you free this week. In Jesus' name, amen.